Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault podcast. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode I'm going to be talking to you about one of the biggest mystery cases in US Navy history and that's a case of Flight 19. Now when I mention Flight 19 I also have to mention the Bermuda Triangle which is another mysterious place in the world which um, you guys would have all heard of. It's it, it's got the reputation for the disappearance of ships and aircraft and one of the cases that really put that on the map was this case that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and when I mentioned Flight 19 it's a case of the five Avenger torpedo bombers that disappeared on December 5th 1945. So I'll give you a little roundup of this um, case before I go into a little bit more detail. So um, the bombers went missing after conducting a basic navigation training exercise and all 14 crew went missing with the planes. And the other thing that makes this case really strange is that they sent out a, a search plane. Um, it was a PBM Mariner and that went missing too with all 13 crew. And to this day, there's been extensive investigations and no one knows what's happened. And there's, and there's been no wreckage, there's been no bodies, no nothing. So let's turn the clock back and we'll go to 1945, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where this incident took place. Now, setting the scene here um, it's a few months after the end of World War Two, and everybody is just trying to get back to, you know, a normal life. And Florida, you know, it's a beautiful place in the world. It's sunny, sunny beaches. People going out like sunbathing. They're enjoying the fact that the war's ended. And in Fort Lauderdale, there is a naval air station um, with the Avenger bombers. So. Being a resident in Florida at this time, you would be f used to these bombers flying over, conducting um, naval exercises. And let's talk about the the torpedo bomber. I mean, it's a it's a beautiful looking plane. It's a plane that you would be familiar with. It's got a um, blue fuse, large with a white underbelly. It's a it's a stunning looking plane. And it was manufactured by General Motors between 1942 and 1960. And it was famous for seeing action in the Battle of the Midway. Um, they were credited for sinking the super battleships from the Japanese fleet, the Yamato and the Mushashi. And pilots would often say that it was like flying a truck in the sky because it was um, one of the biggest uh, single-engined um, heavy bombers. And it would carry three crew, which was a rear gunner, a, a navigator, which would sit in the middle of the plane, or like a radio operator, and then you'll have the pilot. And it was a long range bomber of up to a thousand miles, and it got up to the speed of 278 miles per hour. And this is quite important as well. It's whilst the pilots were conducting training exercises, one of their one of the main exercises being a naval plane, you know, flying over the water, was actually conducting regular safety drills. So, not obviously ditching the plane, but they would sort of go through that drill. So, if it did hit the water, they'd, they'd work out how they're going to get off the plane. The crew would walk onto the wings and activate the life raft. So, the crews of these planes were highly trained. And whilst um, obviously not being in combat, they would go over these drills and um, carry out these exercises. But then having said that, the Avenger bomber is also known amongst the fleet as a difficult bomber to conduct this drill of ditching it into the water, which is something that is important for later on when I get into the main incident. So that's the bomber, that's the crew. Um, let's talk about the Bermuda Triangle. So Fort Lauderdale, is in the Bermuda Triangle and at the time before the, well before this incident people did not recognize the Bermuda Triangle as a mysterious place per se as we do now so when I mentioned the Bermuda Triangle the people people will nine times out of ten go oh yeah that's a place in the world where 
stuff mysteriously disappears and it's a strange place. But this time, it wasn't. that wasn't the case. Um, so the area is in the western part of the North Atlantic and it ranges from Florida and it goes out to Bermuda and then comes back down to Puerto Rico. So with a line you can draw out a triangle. And it's got, the, like I said, it's got the reputation for a number of aircraft and ships that have gone missing um, in mysterious circumstances. And it's also got, in, in pop, popular culture, people refer it to, you know, like paranormal activity and aliens and stuff like that. So it's like what I said before on the old towers, you know, particularly in my last episode of the Mary Celeste, you could just imagine like sailors saying, oh yeah, this disappeared, you know, this plane disappeared, this ship disappeared. And then you'll go into the, oh, well, it could have been the sea monster. And then today in popular culture, um, you know, we refer it to some sort of paranormal activity or aliens, which um, again, it's, you know, when you move on ahead here with the Roswell incident, everybody was into aliens. So the, the mystery world building block as I like to call it is forming and all of these paranormal things get blamed for anything that disappears around the world if if something disappears nine times out of ten we we will someone will come out and probably say today oh probably abducted by aliens or something like that and this is worth mentioning now because as I just said in 1945 this wasn't the speculation um, the Bermuda Triangle wasn't hitting the news or anything like that. Not up until uh, the mid-1960s, after this incident, um, there was books. There was one book in particular by Charles Berlitz, who popularised the triangle with um, a best-selling book. Uh, and he claimed in his book that the Bermuda Triangle then had something to do with the lost city of Atlantis. So the city of Atlantis kind of got thrown in and they that's like become responsible for the disappearances and stuff like that. So the and you can see what's happening here, you know, the more time moves on, the more books that have been um, published about these mysterious events, the more people start to believe in it, I guess in a way, or it, it becomes plausible. And I'm not going to say it is or it isn't because I'll, I'll just put some facts on the table. But again, it, it becomes it becomes a fun topic to talk about and to put these theories on the table. And it's great to hear people's you know um, thoughts on what could be happening in the triangle. So let's give you some more um, facts and figures about the triangle. So the area itself, as I just mentioned, from Florida to the island of Bermuda back to Puerto Rico covers an area of 1.5 million square miles. And the deepest point is 30,000 feet. And one of the things to mention here as well is scientists have had a look at this over the years and there is the agonic line that passes through the tri triangle sometimes and this is like a some sort of magnetic line uh, which causes your compass to go out of control or just in layman terms it just doesn't work at some points when you fly over it your, your compass goes a little bit haywire and scientists have also said that this part of the Atlantic does suffer from uh, bad weather conditions as well. And they've also said that there is a, a point where you could actually have three storms form together on those different points of the north, east, south, west, and they could come together and the triangle would become like that eye of the storm, uh, which could cause a lot of chaos for like ships and planes, which some people have accounted for uh, rogue waves that come up to about 100 foot. Which is again is, is another theory of why why ships out there disappear from time to time. So there's some facts and figures of the Bermuda Triangle itself, its location, um, some of the causes of these disappearances, um, some details about the planes. So let's have a look at the incident itself. So. Let's go back to the 5th of December 1945 and Flight 19 took off from Fort Lauderdale at 1408 and the conditions were nice, it was a nice sunny day, um, the planes were in good condition, they were fully fueled 
And the object of the training exercise was, in a word, a basic navigation exercise. So this is probably one of their basic training packages where they were going to fly out, or they did fly out in a triangle, funny enough, triangle formation um, east towards the Bahamas from Florida and then turn north and then come back round to a west position and then come back to Florida. So it was literally fly out, turn around and come back and having a look at this case um, at the, you know, the, the pilot's fly pan and I, I can't, I can't sort of clarify this enough, but looking at this from a sort of US Navy um, training exercise, this is one of their basic ones. So leading the squadron was Flight Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor, um, who had a wealth of experience. He was he was involved in the, the Pacific campaigns against the Japanese in World War II, and he also had 2,500 hours of flight experience. He also had Captain Powers as well, who was a um, veteran pilot who had a wealth of experience, but most of the crew was made up of trainees. But each of them had a minimum of uh, 30 hours uh, flight experience. So at 2.30pm the squadron arrived at a location called the Hens and Chicken and they conducted a bombing raid which was successful and the communication was going over to the uh, radio tower at Fort Lauderdale and at this time the weather conditions were good and everything was going just fine as planned. They then turned north for a second leg and for reasons unknown this is where Taylor transmitted a problem with his compass and one of his radio messages was the planes are flying in a wrong direction and then this time the weather started to worsen with uh, rain, cloud cover and heavy wind so within a turn of a penny or flick of the coin things just went worse with the weather and then the captain coming out and saying that he doesn't know where he is and the compass is starting to fail. And then there's another transmission where Taylor comes out now and says, I don't know where we are. We must have got lost after that last run. So he's saying that after we've turned north, something has gone wrong. There's then another uh, message from Taylor where he's come out and said, everything looks strange. It looks like we are entering white water. We're completely lost. And then before they knew it, with the radio tower trying to sort of transmit and trying to work out position, a training exercise that was only supposed to last for two hours has turned into four hours. And now Lord Adele was starting to worry, and the crew, obviously the squadron. With a final radio transmission from, I think it was Captain or Lieutenant Taylor, where he said, all planes close tight, we'll have to ditch unless landfall. When the first plane drops below 10 gallons, we'll all go down together. And that was it. It was the last I ever heard of Flight 19. So it suggests that they're lost, they're low on fuel, and the lieutenant has come out with pretty much, I would say, an executive decision to say that we, if we get down to a certain amount of fuel, we're going to have to, to ditch the planes. So with the planes lost, uh, Fort Lauderdale now conduct one of the biggest search and rescue operations in US naval history. And they send out a total of uh, 300 planes and ships which cover 700,000 square miles of the at that part of the Atlantic, the Bermuda Triangle. And then to make this case really... This is kind of what makes this case a real mystery to me not only with these planes disappearing but for then another plane to go missing which is the mariner search plane that gets sent out and that to vanish as well on top of all this at the same time it just it just makes it more of a mystery and this is what's always fascinated me with this case so you know it i, I first became aware of this when i was younger and you know saw this story in a in a book and read about it and it was you know 
from from my perspective as a young kid, you're thinking, oh yeah, these Avenger bombers have gone missing, and then the other plane that went out to go and search for it that went missing as well. So do you know what I mean? It's just what makes it so. Wow, what's going on here? What's going on with this place? But there is um, there are some explanations here, you know, with the certainly the disappearance of the Mariner plane because the location where it there was last communication with it, there was a there was a tanker called the SS Gaines which saw an explosion. And the Mariner search plane had a reputation for being a flying gas bottle or something like that. So they were they were known to blow up in the sky. So there is a kind of like plausible explanation for that. But having said that, with a plane that is exploded say it has exploded, I mean that wasn't like the final um, findings in the investigation, it was just something that, 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 that was plausible or one of the theories, but there was no wreckage found, which is strange, especially with this plane exploding, so. And then after an extensive search, um, no wreckage or bodies were ever found of the missing Flight 19 crew. Nothing, I mean, nothing at all. Up until this day, these planes have completely vanished. Um, so let's have a look at what could have happened. And again, this is what I've researched um, on the internet. So it, even though Lieutenant Taylor was an experienced pilot, um, with all, all the experience he had from World War II, and with the planes in good condition, the trainee pilots... Um, plenty of fuel. These were long range, range bombers. They could fly up to a thousand miles. And you hear the word, yeah, this is a basic training exercise. Um, but still, you know, I mean, I'm not a pilot myself, but you, you've heard these things where, you know, the, some of the best laid plans can go wrong. And in this case, let's just say, you know, it, it, you know Taylor's taken a wrong turn on the compass. Something's just, something's gone wrong. It's a minor thing. And it can happen to anybody, you know, you put it in any situation. And I'm not talking about just being a pilot, but I'm talking about any sort of situation in life. I won't, I won't use an example, but you can, there's that old saying in there. It's like the domino effect. One thing's gone wrong, then it's sort of escalated. So in this case, you've got an experienced pilot where all the trainees are probably dependent on him. He may have made just one mistake on this day with the compass and he's flown in the wrong direction thinking he's going back to land and from there onwards it's like I've flown out and then I've turned around I've made another mistake and then things have all gone wrong and the the layout of this area as well is the the Bahamas looks a lot like the Florida Keys and the other thing with Taylor is that he was a pilot who was uh, newly commissioned to Fort Lauderdale. So this wasn't his familiar territory. So he may have flown over, say flown over the Florida Keys before and he's looked at it from the sky. He's then flown over the Bahamas and then thought, oh, that's possibly the Florida Keys, which is in a, um, a south position from Fort Lauderdale. So you think that he could, he's mistaken those islands. And then he's turned, say, like north on his second leg to think, oh, I'm going back up to Fort Lauderdale. But then he hasn't. What he's done is, and this is one of the theories, is that he's flown over the Bahamas thinking that, that that's the keys. For some reason, he's taken a north turn and instead of flying back to base, he's then f flying out into the Atlantic in a north position. So he's going away from the land. And then this is where the confusion sets in. And they said about um, there was a storm and there was rain and then the wind. So you put all that into it as well. Um, there's a bit of confusion. There's going to be panic as well because you're looking at the uh, fuel doll and you're thinking, you know, I'm running low on fuel. Um, there's a bit of like panic. There's a bit of anxiety. What am I going to do? Um, you've got these trainee pilots depending on him. But then having said that, okay, and there's one transmission which I would say they've got some sort of plan even at the last minute and that is the last transmission where uh, Taylor's come out and said 
when the lot when the first plane gets down to 10 gallons we're gonna have to all form together and ditch and in, in my mind that is a that's a plan that's like that is like your plan b and, and this is go this goes back to what i said at the beginning um these pilots even though the trainees have only had like 30 hours experience like They've gone over some extensive training to actually ditch these planes in a scenario and to work that out. And I would say that if the plan is as like Captain Taylor saying, 10 gallons, that will give us enough fuel to conduct um, a landing onto the sea. Obviously not ideal. I imagine it's an incredibly dangerous task. But it, it says to me that they've got the plan then to use that remaining fuel to do that ditch into the into the ocean and as I said at the beginning I did I tried to do a little bit of research on the planes here where these are they're like flying trucks in the sky they're heavy heavy bombers but at the same time I would imagine they are designed to actually ditch into the um, ocean to give you some some time but the um, success rate of that is quite low. These planes were known to have that reputation of, you know, if you ditch it into the water, there's a good chance it's not going to, you know, be successful, but, you know, we still have to operate that. But then it goes into, for me, it goes into the laws of probability. So say you have got 10 gallons left, right? And then you, you can conduct this um, landing into the sea. The laws of probability to, to me is kind of like that sort of one out of five. So you've got five planes that are going to conduct this together. If it was just one plane that went missing and ditched, I would say, yeah, there's a good chance that it just ditched and it went straight into the water and it was that heavy, it, it, it just went straight to the bottom of the ocean. But with the laws of probability, I reckon one out of the five would have conducted um, a landing like textbook to how it's supposed to. And this is kind of what makes it mysterious for me to say that you know, five of these planes all hit the water and all did exactly the same thing. Which, okay, you know, I'm going to say you can't rule out. Maybe on this, you know, because this, you know, you'd look into this. That's obviously what happened. You know, when you look at it, they, is it the case that they all ditched together and they all went to the bottom of the ocean and that was it, vanished, boom, gone? Um, and I've even thought about this. Is it, it, this is the one thing that's kind of thrown my mind because it's a it, you throw a dice. Let's, let's use a dice in this situation. You throw it. You could get a five first time. This is obviously what's happening in this case. But you throw it a few times, you might get a one, a two, three, whatever. Um, and this is where probability goes into. It. And I think that would that's that's for me. That's the way I've looked into this. And it blows my mind to think this must have been one of the un most unluckiest days in US naval history to the, you know lose five planes like this. They've all done exactly the same thing. Impact, gone into the water, gone to the bottom of the ocean. No one's got out of the plane. They've completely disappeared. And then on top of that, the one of the rescue planes that goes out to go and look for you then disappears as well. And then, you know, say that just that's blown up in the sky and this is the other thing that blows my mind it, say that plane has blown up then where's all the wreckage for the, the plane and it, it, this is where you know this is where it's thrown investigators off and people have tried to work this case out I'm sure um, and then the other thing that I've also looked at as well um, is how about surviving in these conditions. So say the plane has successfully ditched into the water. All the pilots have got out. Say 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 one of the pilots or one of the planes you know successfully ditched. They've got into their life raft and they've got some rations, they've got their life jackets, um, and now it's the case of them, you know, trying to survive until the rescue team turns up. And it's not like one plane it's going to look from this is like one of the largest and one of the biggest operations in US naval history so there's a good chance if they are in that life raft they're going to get found and I looked into this and this has happened before 
certainly with the uh, you know Pacific campaigns where you know planes have ditched and pilots have got out. And I think one of the longest um, survivors in a life raft, I think it's when a Liberator bomber ditched into the into the ocean, and they survived for 30 days. So I looked into that as well. So you can survive for a long time out in the ocean. I think in this case, if you've got a, a large operation that's going out there looking for you, there's a good chance that you're going to get found. So. Yeah, as you can hear, I'm, I'm, I'm literally hanging on the edge of a cliff here trying to work this out in in this case. Um, so there are some some facts here. So one of them being that the planes do not have a successful um, ditch into the ocean, right? Uh, Captain Taylor was new to the territory, so he wasn't, he wasn't familiar to this area, but he was a, a very experienced pilot with 2,500 hours. Uh, the Bermuda Triangle, as we now know it, has that reputation for messing up your compass. So that could be plausible in this case, plus the fact that I've had a look at some interviews with some old pilots and they've said, you know, those compasses on those old planes weren't incredibly accurate. And you really were sort of like putting your life in your own hand sometimes flying out into the sea on those planes. Um, so that that's plausible. You've got a malfunction with a compass, um, and then obviously, as I said, you know the ditching into the ocean, which has kind of blown my mind away when it comes down to the um, probability. And then, of course, you've then got, as I've said before, with the mystery world, which is the vital thing that makes this all a mystery in a way, and you know stories that we tell was the media and books and publishing and of course you know you got a case like this you know the media get hold of it and say that these five planes have disappeared the rescue plane's gone out and disappeared as well there's going to be stories isn't there? there's going to be mysteries and particularly as i mentioned earlier in the 1970s with these books being published oh you know could it have been aliens could it have been the paranormal <laughs> As I said before, yeah, I suppose you can't rule that out as well. You know, could they have been abducted by aliens? Well, um, because we found no wreckage or anything like that. I guess you can't rule that out either. But you know, that's that's where it comes into like a sort of like folklore town stuff like that. Um, so yeah, you know, like I say, guys. As I said, I'm I'm hanging on the edge of a cliff here. I, I can't work this out. But there's a few theories there that i've put onto the table for you guys to go away and you know hopefully that's giving you some you know thought if you have heard of this case before or you haven't heard of this case before but what i will say you know as as a sort of roundup um the bermuda triangle itself and this case has entered the world of hollywood um it's worth mentioning that it did turn up in a really good sci-fi movie called Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Flight 19 turns up in there and Spielberg has suggested that, <laughs> well probably not himself it's, it's all like storytelling stuff like that but they say that they got abducted by the aliens and the the planes turn up in a desert or something like that, um, which is cool so and at the same time, you know, you can see how people could take away that theory, you know, because that film came out in the 70s with at a time when the mystery world was booming in, in books and things like that and um, you know sort of popular culture and all that sort of stuff um, so there you go so I'll leave it at that guys as you can hear my you know that's why I love talking about these cases because it kind of blows my mind and it really gets you thinking it really does you know I've, I've spent a little bit of time with this trying to work it out and you, you do sort of go back and forwards and you think oh could this happen could that happen and how come no wreckage, you know, no wreckage has turned up? And, you know, I guess until they physically find a plane at the bottom of that ocean, we, we will never know. But I have found a positive out of this. Um, and I will say this now is that, um, you know, dedication to the, the men, you know, the pilots that, that did lose their lives on that day. And I would say that. You know, in a positive way, that all the time that we are telling this story, these these guys live on, and I'm sure they're they're up there in their planes, flying around, looking down on us, telling this story, and 
you know, hopefully there's a little smile on their face thinking, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be forever remembered. So, you know, I've, I've taken a sort of positive out of, out of a negative there. So, like I say, dedication to those, um, you know, pilots that lost their lives on that fateful day. So there you go, guys. Um, I will leave it at that. And um, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Um, let me tell you what's coming up next. And I've, I've got a load. I've, I've got lots of choices in the mystery world. Um, and the one that I have picked up is the crop circle mysteries because as I said before I'm, I'm kind of building some of the famous cases because they're important ones to talk about because um, the reason why I'm doing it in this sort of format is because they will be cases that I will go back to because I think th some of these mysteries can all sort of tie up together in some ways so I'm going to do the big hitters first and then go into the sort of lesser known mysteries, which which will be a whole ton of fun as well. So, um, yeah, crop circles. Um, and, you know, and I've, this is the other thing doing this show. All routes lead back to the aliens. The aliens get blamed for all this sort of stuff, don't they? Anything that turns up, yeah, it's got to be an alien. <laughs> so... Uh, whether whether they exist or not, they're going to get blamed for everything that goes on. So um, I'll leave that thought with you. But there you go, guys. Hope, like I say, hope you enjoyed the episodes. A um, little bit of admin for the show. I'm a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network, so please go and check out all the other shows on there, including my other show, which is called Bite Size Cinema Podcast, where I review movies. And you can find the Mystery Vault Podcast on several players on the internet. Uh, you've got iTunes, Spotify, and if you put in the Mystery Vault podcast um, onto Google, it will take you to a server where you can listen to the show. Um, I've also got a Facebook page, so um, that's where I'm most active. So put anything on there, if there's any suggestions or anything you want me to have a look at, um, yeah, put it on there and I'll, I'll have a look into it for you. Um, so there you go, guys. Um, Keep it spooky, keep it mysterious, keep it safe, and I'll see you soon. I think this is a ghost story. I think this is a ghost story. this show then make sure you check out the other great shows on the legion podcast network like cinema psyops cinema b devour the podcast duncan and Bo come correct exploding heads horror movie podcast friday the 13th get slayed the hell Ming power hour hello this is the doom show hero hero ghost show kill the cast underwater kaiju from outer space jerry hates action legion after dark metal health obsessive cinema discourse Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shadecast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found. <laughs>